Um, <clears throat> so yes, what I'd like to talk to you about today is a, a misguided adventure, as I've called it, into the self-assembly of amyloid fibrils. Um, so as with all good stories, uh, this story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and the introduction here uh, has a, a picture of me that I uh, reasonably commonly use online for things like I don't know, LinkedIn or ResearchGate, whatever that may happen to be. Little known fact about this picture is that I actually, uh, well, my wife took it for me um, because I needed um, a picture for a pass so that I could go to a synchrotron um, for my first visit when I was an undergraduate student. So I actually had this picture taken uh, before my first visit to Diamond Light Source. Uh, and as many of you will know, uh, I now work there. Um, and when you work somewhere, they tend to take a picture of you when you start for your pass. Uh, and this, is, this was taken about a decade after this picture. So 10 years of small angle x-ray scattering turned me from this bright young upstart into this person, uh, which is probably slightly more reflective of uh, what I look like today. Anyway, that's a slight aside. Um, so I started out at the University of Reading and I did a master's degree in chemistry. Uh, and I was looking at amyloid fibrils. Um, so this was kind of overview presentation slide I had after I finished my undergraduate, it's kind of summing up what I'd done. Um, so I, I'd kind of shown that uh, at low pH and at high temperatures, um, certain proteins will self-assemble firstly into these kind of strands and later on into, into fibers, into fibrils. So I'll go into that a bit more in detail later. <clears throat> we kind of showed that that works. Um, and that if you're to take just a protein in solution uh, in a particular buffer environment, given a few days, so maybe two or three days, you can go from a, a thin liquid to a gel-like solution containing these fibers. Uh, we noticed that, uh, or I noticed that uh, as we were conducting these measurements, uh, that different uh, buffers, so different environments that the, the protein finds itself in will give different morphologies. So although the stacking of the proteins may remain more or less identical, the actual fiber that is created is different. Uh, and also that with these different morphologies that we were creating, uh, kinetics, I was looking, well, looking into the kinetics, the kinetics was obviously slightly different. Uh, and I was kind of interested at the time at looking into dissociating these things. I was trying to work out whether one particular type of fibril was more stable than the other, or maybe it wasn't. The evidence will come out later as we go through this presentation. Anyway, after finishing my undergraduate degree, I took a, a bit of a, a detour and I went off to the University of Bristol and I started looking at polymers. So in this case, polymer brushes being grafted from surfaces. Uh, and I had a real um, love of trying to get these things to, to graft from mica, which is a mineral, um, because I was quite interested in surface forces and we wanted to use a surface force apparatus. Anyone who's seen one of these instruments will know um, you're basically relying on two curved pieces of mica. So although we managed to graft polymers from a whole range of different substrates, uh, Mica was the preferred one. And eventually I ended up taking some AFM measurements, some XPS measurements, X-ray reflectivity uh, and surface force measurements on these systems. And as, as everyone does throughout their PhDs, there are a number of side projects with self-assembled systems with lipids and various other things. Um, but this was the kind of main focus of my work. Then after a sh short postdoc, um, I ended up at Diamond again. Um, and I'm now a senior software scientist there doing data analysis for I-22 and soft condensed matter. Uh, and the first thing I kind of started on was looking at data corrections and getting some automated data reduction working, looking at different ways of doing background subtractions, things like that to help people get more steady data. More recently, we've been looking at different scanning methodologies that we can give to people. So the idea of um, we now use hardware scanning or fly scanning so that people can get information they want faster. <clears throat> but I purposely left this last box a little bit empty because uh, one of the things that I had in my position, a lot of people have a diamond, is a scientific remit as well. So the obvious question is, well, what's that going to be? Um, I could continue things I was doing in my PhD or my postdoc, or I could go back to some things I was doing before, or you know, collaborate with new people, open up uh, new areas of research for myself. But ultimately, what it came down to is that uh, I felt my my PhD had uh, concluded quite well, um, but my undergraduate. Uh, kind of work for my final year projects, there were a load of unanswered questions. So I got in touch with my, my old supervisor who was at Reading at the time, his name's Adam Squires, and I said I got some ideas and it turned out that he'd recruited a PhD, a PhD student in the interim who was looking at similar systems, his name was Ben. And I started talking to some other people on the, the rail campus and we kind of cooked up a bit of a scheme and before I knew it we had this kind of idea where 
we were going to put a rheometer onto the I-22 beam line and try and do some in situ sacks of amyloid fibril formation whilst also looking at some kinetics data um, or some rheology data and kinetics data. Um, so we kind of cooked up the scheme and we, we got going on it. But before I go too much into that, I'll, I'll dive back a little bit and start out with uh, some of the, I guess, more, more basic questions that some people might have. Um, so amyloids, what actually are they? Amyloid fibrils. Um, so these are proteins in solution that have gone from being nice, coiled, folded, wonderful, very intricate things um, to being unfolded and or they maybe in some kind of intermediary state. Usually this is driven by uh, changes to the solution that they're in. So uh, for a lot of the work that I was doing as an undergraduate, we were using significant changes in pH, so something around about pH one or two, in order to drive these proteins to go into an unfolded state or a partially folded state. Once they're in this state and given a significant amount of time, um, they start to do some interesting things. So you get intramolecular uh, um, associations, so maybe things like beta sheets start associating with each other and you get kind of formations there, but also on a, on a kind of intermolecular scale, you also get these things start to associate with each other as well. Um, initially, what you tend to see is that uh, these proteins can come together and start stacking. So in terms of uh, what you might think of diagrammatically, you could end up with something that looked like this, where you've got stacks of these proteins on top of each other. And that kind of gets you somewhere, as in this particular diagram up here, where we're somewhere between some kind of spherical oligomers and some kind of protofibril type state. With time, uh, we start seeing that these little stacks, uh, rather than getting much, much longer, start to associate with other stacks as well to form these fibers. And from there, there's this template, this kind of driving effect for these fibers to then start to elongate outwards. And that ends us uh, in this kind of final state down here of these mature amyloid fibrils. And if you're looking in the wide angle regime, uh, you tend to get two reflections. So we've got this kind of 10 to 11 angstrom reflection here, which is your interstack, or your, your kind of inter. Um, protein stack uh, distance and something around about 4.7, 4.8 angstroms out here. And that's mainly, to, uh, well, that's due to the uh, stacking of these protein sets relationship and their distance. <clears throat> it's worth noting that um, this is your kind of idealized, this is where I'd like to be end state. However, um, sometimes they do get trapped in the kind of spherical oligomer or um, just kind of random distribution of proteins area. So it's not uncommon. Um, to have a kind of you know, proteinaceous masses and other things growing in solution. Um, but hopefully there are things you can do to mitigate these, uh, the, the formation. So uh, where do we find amyloids? Next question. Uh, well, unfortunately, the news for this isn't particularly good. Um, so things like amyloid beta and prion proteins have been associated with things like Alzheimer's disease, CJD, BSE, um, you know, all of the really nice things that nobody wants to have. Um, and unfortunately, once the fibrillization process starts, it does tend to spread throughout compatible tissue. And by that, by compatible tissue, I mean things that share that kind of same protein. Um, so things that it can template or things it can grow off. Um, and as you can see from the, the lower figure here of these, these pieces of brain, um, obviously these changes are quite widespread and uh, are not particularly beneficial to the host. So there is quite a lot of interest in either slowing this process down or alternatively, uh, halting the process. I, in an ideal world, one would say you could reverse it. But given the complexity of these proteins and where they tend to find themselves, just halting it itself would be a miracle. Um, actually reversing back to where you started would basically be unheard of. You'd almost have to know exactly how things started out um, before, before you could actually go back. So now having a bit of information about whether these things can be found and what they're made of. Um, how are we going to look at these or what kind of aspects might we want to investigate? So I've already mentioned I was quite keen on the kind of kinetics of formation. So um, we've got many different environments these things can grow in. Um, are they all going to adopt the same structures? If they do, uh, then is the kinetics the same or is the kinetic pathways the same? Are the speeds uh, of these things or the speeds of these fibrillizations the same or different in different environments? You know, what kind of things can we pull out from the kinetics? Thinking about this idea of uh, propagation through material, so looking at um, you know brains and other pieces of your body slowly uh, being laid waste to by amyloidosis, um, is there a catalytic effect that can can be measured and seen? And again, 
if it is occurring in one part of the body with one protein, why isn't it occurring in another part of the body with the same protein? Is it something to do with the environment it's in? Is there a, a, a native or cross templating effect? Can, can these things transfer? And then kind of finally, um, we've, we've seen the endpoints of, of what these fibers turn into. We end up with amyloid plaques in, uh, in biological matter. Um, but due to the nature of these things being twisted and rotated and generally being kind of free to move around, there's actually very little kind of, I mean, people have uh, had goes at working out what the internal structure would be over the year, but nobody's actually managed to do um, something like you might have in crystallography where you accurately work everything out. So is there any way we can probe the internal fiber structure uh, in a slightly more straightforward way? And can we also potentially do it in situ? So with those kind of questions in mind, and what we might want to look at, the first thing you might think, right, is okay, what kind of uh, analytical pathways are, are open to me to, to, to look at these things? And historically, a lot of people have done measurements using things like uh, ultraviolet, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy or fluores uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. Uh, and if we look at this uh, picture here that I've taken, um, we can see that over a course of 48 hours, um, we start with a kind of clear liquid over here, moving onwards and onwards towards a thick gel-like uh, fibril containing solution. So for UV vis, something like turbidity is, is wonderful because obviously these solutions going from clear to more or less opaque. So we can we can look at that change in opacity with respect to time. And I've got a kind of figure down here of what one of those scans might look like where you start off with something that's got a bit of a lower absorption, moving up to a higher absorption with respect to time. <clears throat> And there are limitations to this uh, process, which I'll talk about in my next slide. The other thing that people commonly use is, or use, uh, is fluorescence. So using a dye such as Conga Red or Thioflavin T. Um, and this is quite powerful because you can see whether something's bound to the free protein in solution, or you can see whether it's bound to the fiber. And you can start to think about working at concentrations, potentially based on the amount of fluorescence that comes out. Um, but in the good old kind of style of quantum mechanics, we're, we're vaguely changing the result by observing it, by adding another uh, ingredient into the mix. And because it's binding to things and is also changing its fluorescence spectra based on its bindings, it's almost certain to be having some effect. Whether or not that effect is that large, whether it's hugely measurable, um, that's something that hasn't been quantified so rigorously because there haven't been that many approaches to not using fluorescence. Um, so what we were looking at at the time uh, and what I've been kind of looking at since really are these, this idea of having a, a marker free uh, kinetic uh, marker or something that we can, sorry, not marker, marker free kinetic pathway, something we can use in order to determine what's going on kinetically, but without using some kind of marker molecule or, or fl uh, fluorophore. Um, so the problem that we really have with turbidity is that at some point the sample becomes so turbid or so opaque um, that actually the measurement just kind of maxes out. So maybe um, if I'm going for a complete fibrillization from zero to 72 hours, for example, after 24 hours, as far as the UV vis spectrometer is concerned, yep, it's turbid. That's it. I can't tell you anymore. You just get kind of limits. Um, that may or may not be the end point of your particular self-assembly. Uh, more often than not, it isn't. Uh, and that's not particularly helpful. Um, however, x-rays, on the other hand, if could be used, uh, are a lot more penetrating. Um, so they should be able to see the process all the way through to the end. And um, as we, if we utilize scattering, uh, we can get information about what's going on inside the solution as well. But obviously, there are limits you have to apply to this. But for the early stages, especially, not only can you say, yes, concentration is increasing or yes, fibrillization is occurring. But you can say, ah, and it looks like it is a rod because we looked at the gradient in this kind of mid-Q range. Or, you know, we can fit this to some, um, some models and say, yes, actually, this looks like it is a rod. And this has got an aspect ratio of roughly this. So maybe the radius is, as we say, about maybe a nanometer or something. And yes, we can see it's growing with respect to time. And here's the kind of rate. So there's quite a lot of detail we could um, guess out from uh, x-ray scattering, which is why I ended up going down this, this long pathway. So the first question I was asking myself as an undergraduate all those years ago was, uh, are all fibrils equal? Um, so going back and thinking about uh, fibers being uh, present in different places inside your body or different environments, um, if I were to take some fibers that I made in a pH2 solution, so this is, all of this data is um, based on lysozyme. Um, if I put some lysozyme in pH2 HCl, and I put some lysozyme in pH 2 HCl that also is 20% ethanol and has 0.1 molar sodium chloride in it, do I get the same fiber? 
And if we look at the, the wide angle um, scattering that's obtained from um, a dried aliquot of this solution, we can see that there are some very clear structural differences. Um, so obviously not all of these fibers have the same overall morphology. If I take some of the fibers that I've made um, first time round, and I use a process such as freeze thawing to break the gel network up to make them a little bit more malleable. And I take a small aliquot of that and put that into a new solution. Um, the question I then had was, will, what, uh, what will come out the other side? So we notice that there's a catalytic effect maybe, um, but what we also see is that as we go generationally, so first generation, second generation, third generation, and so forth, um, that there's, there are changes to the structure, but they're, they're more, it almost looks like they're kind of headed towards an endpoint. So that maybe there's some refinement, maybe some of the, the disordered kind of structures that are around in solution are slowly getting filtered out by, um, there being such a high concentration of, uh, fibers. Maybe there is one particular fiber structure that is, uh, more, um, favorable in a kind of energy landscape than others. And we're slowly heading towards that kind of endpoint. Um, unfortunately, as these things take quite a while to form, actually doing say 50, 60 generations is incredibly uh, time consuming, expensive as well, uh, and uh, a real labor of love, which I did not have time for. Um, I kind of vaguely mentioned a, a catalytic effect. Um, so I said initially, if you're going to make fibers, you're talking about quite a long um, incubation period. So we're talking days. Uh, if we just take the the second generation, so if I've got some some seeds from my initial kind of solution that I've created and I put them into uh, another um, monomer solution or another um, protein solution, we can see that if I take fibrils from the same environment and put them inside uh, the same monomer solution, so in this case I've got my uh, uh, seeds and uh, solution of this same um, HCl, um, ethanol and salt solution, the Rate, uh, rate of fibrillization massively increases so that we're actually getting almost to the end point within about say two or three hours, um, sorry, more like three hours. Um, and we can see very quickly that there is a definite catalytic effect here. If I take some uh, fibrillous seeds from PH2HCl and I put those into this ethanol salted uh, monomer solution, we can see that it still catalyzes the reaction for sure, um, but actually the time period over which this occurs is much slower than it is for the kind of native uh, catalytic uh, t um, acceleration of, of growth. So <clears throat> the kind of thing to see here is that although it is possible to do cross seeding, um, there is a penalty associated with that, and that's almost certainly to do with the, the kinetic barrier not being re reduced quite as much as it is for something in its native state. Um, one could try an infinite number of different permutations to try and work out what the kind of most ideal uh, solution or something with the lowest energy barrier may be. Um, but again, there's only so much time in anyone's research career. So we tend to stick to a, a relatively narrow, th uh, narrow series of things, or in this case, something that was vaguely biologically relevant. Uh, so you may have noticed that for a lot of these uh, diagrams I've been showing so far, showing kinetics from turbidity measurements, they've all had uh, these red and green curves superimposed on top of them. Um, these were fits that I performed at the time to work out uh, roughly what kind of pathway uh, this uh, fibrillization may be going down. Um, so most of these uh, processes are described as exponential um, because of how they're, they're progressing. Um, and what I was really doing was trying to find out how many phases uh, for association gave the best fit. I mainly focused on one, two, and three phase, but kind of discounted three phase later on um, for reasons I'll cover in a second. Um, so for a one phase exponential fit, what we're essentially saying is that uh, one end of the fibril itself is where all of the proteins are binding to. And for a two phase fit, we're saying that both sides is potentially where the protein can be binding to. Um, it's intuitive to think uh, that if you've got essentially something that is symmetrical and has the same potentials on either side, uh, that the monomers, or in this case, the, the protein should be binding um, equally to either side and therefore a two phase fit would be best. Um, however, that is not a very rigorous scientific process. Um, so I did uh, actually do the fits to make sure that this was the case. Um, 
there is a, a vague kind of line of argument. You could say, well, if you keep increasing the number of parameters forever and ever and ever, the fit will continue to get better and better. Um, however, the reason for discarding the three-phase exponential fit was largely based on the fact that the fitting didn't actually get any any better at all. Um, and it wasn't particularly physical in terms of the processes that were occurring. The reason I was thinking about a three-phase exponential fit to start with is that there is quite a lot of uh, published literature on um, a phenomenon that when these fibrils are forming, that they're also breaking and therefore new active sites are appearing. Um, so looking at the three phase was kind of a way of saying, well, maybe there's slightly more than two active sites present on average per uh, initial uh, fiber that we have. However, that did not seem to bear any kind of uh, better, or it didn't increase the goodness of it or seem to actually do anything for the data apart from adding more parameters, which isn't necessarily particularly useful. Okay. So um, looking towards the, the shear studies now, um, so initially the kind of measurements I'm taking, as you saw before, were from, um, from little uh, Eppendorf tubes. Um, so the easiest way to kind of mirror that here is with this brass block that I've got, uh, which is one of the sample environments on ice too. And you can put a capillary in, heat it up, and then carry out your fibrillization. You could do this. Um, there are potential problems with beam damage with respect to time with this approach because it continues to hitting the same area. Um, but what we were really interested in was this idea to be able to do cross correlation. So it has been shown that as uh, the fibrillization process is proceeding, it is getting more viscous. It's turning into a gel. We can measure that with a rheometer, in this case, using a cup and bob um, set up quite straightforwardly. So we can look at viscosity as well as using x-rays to actually look at what's changing in the sample itself. In addition, we can also look at things like rod length within the experimental limits. The initial uh, set of shear studies that we, we obtained, um, and for this we were using lysozyme in pH 1 rather than pH 2, uh, what we were comparing was uh, I0 values from small angle scattering measurements and comparing that with uh, the viscosity measurements. So you can see that these two curves are tracking each other very well. Um, for those of you who may not have come across the idea of extrapolating, getting an I0 value, basically what we're trying to do is work out from the, the small angle data that we have, if we extrapolate our curve towards uh, the zero Q point, uh, what that intensity would be. Um, it is worth noting that the, the rheology data is very smooth, um, whereas the I0 data is a bit more, what should we say, jaggedy. Um, the, the rheology data is being polled very frequently. I think it was every second whereas we're only taking a frame of data from the small angle scattering every minute. Um, it's also worth noting that um, there are things like, because it's becoming a particularly turbid, uh, sorry, turbid viscous solution, um, that things like air bubbles are appearing as well, which leads to odd effects when you're trying to find uh, your I0 measurement or your I0 point. Right, um, next up, what I'd like to take you through is um, a short video um, that's actually one of those measurements. So this is the 100 reciprocal second shear rate data from before. And this was a, a two hour long experiment overall with a frame taken every minute. What I'm gonna do is just take you through the video first, bit by bit, and then I'll play it back as a whole. Um, so we start out and we see that there is subtle changes in the intensity near the beam stop, so close to our I0 value. And then around about here, we start seeing quite a marked increase in the amount of scattering intensity. So that's that sigmoidal function as we're, we're entering into this exponential growth phase. As we are shearing our sample, and we're putting quite a lot of effort into it at this point, we're seeing some alignment of the sample and a little bit of jiggle as it's moving around because it's not a, it's not a perfect system, I guess. Um, we see slightly more intensity as a particular, that kind of lower ring there in Q. And that continues for a while as we let the experiment progress. Then at this point here, we actually turn the rheometer off. So we're still taking measurements, but we're no longer shearing the sample. And what we see is a change in the scattering intensity profile around that point. And I must apologize for that frame. This is, um, this is also histogramic. Um, and then as we proceed onwards, we start seeing something that we hadn't seen before for um, lower shear rates, which is the appearance of this Dubai share ring with also um, some vague orientation in it as well. And because this is quite close to the beam stop on a small angle X-ray scattering detector, um, I can't remember the exact value. I think this is either 198 or 200 nanometer feature that we're seeing. So something very periodic happening at about 200 nanometers. What we put this down to was as the, the fibers are relaxing because they've been sheared, maybe they've started to associate with each other on a, a much more macroscopic level. 
So if I now take this, take this back to the start, play it through so that you can see it, that is the, the kind of time lapse of uh, two hours of synchrotron time. Uh, this is um, kind of taking this data a little bit further, um, but all of these pictures that you can see here on the right hand side are all of the same uh, histogramming now, so they're all, they're all the same uh, upper and lower intensity. Um, so starting again from top to bottom, we've got that during the, during the actual shear itself, about two minutes after the shear, and then about 10 minutes after the shear. And what we can see is that we have definitely changed the self-assembly uh, of the fibrils um, from well, their shear state to their, their final state where there is some alignment present. <clears throat> so um, I guess in summary, uh, what I kind of like to say is uh, when I was doing my undergraduate studies, I managed to kind of vaguely show that uh, the same protein in different environments can have different morphologies associated with it on a, on a more microscopic level. And seeded growth is possible. So catalysis is a thing, who knew? Um, but you can also have templates in different buffer solutions, although there is a bit of a kinetic penalty. Uh, the kinetic, kinetic data itself fits better to a dual exponential, pointing towards this idea of having the fibril, um, so, well, sorry, the monomers or the proteins associating onto both ends of the fiber. Uh, and I zero values show a strong correlation with rheology data, meaning that if one were to use um, synchrotron or in fact a strong lab source um, and I zero values, you could almost certainly infer where in the fibrillization process you are using small angle x-ray scattering as a marker free way of tracking the experiment and also extracting out parameters of interest. Uh, and when we put these things into a shear cell, we saw some interesting effects with this odds uh, kind of settling at the end. Building on that, what I'd like to do in the future, um, if time were to come up, uh, would be to take a fully fibrillized sample, so something that's been in a rheometer and allowed to, to gelate, and then start moving it again. It would be really interesting to see what happens with not only the small angle scattering profiles, um, but also potentially if we can see associated networks as we apply sheer force to the system, we should be able to get an idea of association, association strength of either the overall gel or potentially the actual fibers themselves. So one thing that I didn't show, um, but uh, the beamline that we were using, I-22 Diamond, which is a Sachs, uh, simultaneous Sachs and Wax beamline, uh, we also got some wide angle data out as well where we could see the reflections um, for both the four and the 10 angstrom uh, features in our fibers. What would be interesting to see is if we applied yet more shear, whether we could break up the, the 10 angstrom uh, interaction, so bringing them back down into their original protein stacks, or potentially if we went really crazy uh, and but hopefully not melt the rheometer in the process, break up those stacks as well, maybe. That's possibly not possible. Uh, that, that might be a bit impossible, I don't know, but breaking up the, um, the fibers into stacks may well be doable. Um, preliminary results were encouraging for this wide angle data, but as you can see, it's a bit grainy owing to uh, the large air gap for one, uh, and also various things coming up in solution like bubbles, for example. So uh, more rigorously applied subtractions are required to at least state these structural features, and that's quite a time consuming um, process. Uh, with that, the only thing I have left is to thank some people. Um, so when I was at the University of Reading, uh, Adam Squires was my supervisor, and I mentioned that uh, he had a PhD student, Ben. Uh, ben made up the um, fibril, uh, well, yes, all of the fibril solutions and the um, protein solutions for the shear experiment that we had. Um, about a year after I started at Diamond, both Adam and Ben moved from the University of Reading to Bath. Uh, Adam is still at Bath now. Uh, I'd also thank, like to thank the peer review panel for giving me some beam time uh, and at Diamond also Andy and Nick on I-22 and Jake Phillick uh, who's my line manager at Diamond and gave me some good uh, heads ups on how to do some of the analysis and get started with my job as well uh, and over at ISIS James Douch uh, for coming down the rabbit hole with me and uh, <laughs> starting with these crazy shear measurements on I-22 and uh, also yourselves for listening so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.